systematic desensitization. Anyone ever heard of it? I knew right away I could never even contemplate asking the patient to do a straight face because the idea was you had the patient imagine they were in that phobic situation like you're on a plane. And uh, you know, the imagery alone would be paired with relaxation training. Uh, I said to myself, there's no way any human being is going to generate vivid imagery for something to spend their whole life avoiding. And this is 1979. So I said, something like virtual reality that became available, it would change the profession. 20 years later, my wife calls me and says, turn on CNN. And sure enough, Pentium computers have finally become powerful enough to drive the software and the hardware. I flew down to New Orleans for the first conference a few weeks later and met the early pioneers. The thing that we're most proud of is we were the first group to combine it and raise the success rate from 60% to 92% by using a specific type of biofeedback called heart rate variability, which I'll get into later on. With the idea that a, the picture's worth a thousand words, and the video is worth a million. I want to show you a uh, clip that was done by National Geographic. Because when we presented our findings at the first international virtual reality conference in Laval, France, I was contacted by National Geographic and they said, look, we want to do a documentary on what you're doing. Because nobody gets 90%. And uh, if it doesn't work, we're going to do the documentary anyway, and you could be ruined. And I said, we'll do it. So they brought us a patient who was a teacher at Dalton. And her fear of flying was so severe that if a plane came in too low, and she thought she could see the pilot's face, she'd have a panic attack. And Central Park, LaGuardia Airport, not too far apart, the planes come in low. She had a panic attack, leaving all of her little children unsupervised in the Central Park. Uh, needless to say, many of the parents wanted her to get fired, but uh, they said, look, you've got an anxiety disorder, you've got a phobia, get some treatment. And that was our patient. Uh, so I want to show you what technology was like back in 2003. This was the first VR system how it works, and then we'll get into all the other stuff. So you can start that out. My fears of flying began, um, I would say, almost eight, nine years ago. I think the first time I started to feel a sense of fear about flying was when I watched the movie Alive. <laughs> People who have phobias about flying. That's my son. <laughs> and very often it's the only thing they have. But very often it's not. Very often the fear of flying is really the fear of being closed in and claustrophobic. I think it was cool when I was a kid. I went to Italy when I was 12 years old, there was no fears. And then I, once I became a teenager and kind of understood, you know, as you get older you realize, you know, how precious life is and how quickly it could be taken away. And that's when it really kind of set in for me. It's so completely the normal. Day is right right now. Anybody who ever says virtual reality is really uh, giving patients a sense of experiencing the focus situation. Now, it's difficult. We can expose patients to whatever area of flight is that creates the most anxiety. Uh, taking off is the worst part of the flight for me. Once I'm up in the air, as long as we're pretty steady, I'm okay. But the taking off is just an unnatural feeling for me. That's her. 
nervous system right there. He's got a lot of skin response. I'll show you the end of the cell. You didn't take off, so I'd like you to get out the window now, please. new connections that are made, and changing the threshold of resting neurons. Something aggressive like electroconvulsive shock therapy actually changes resting neurons. We don't do that. Uh, legally, we can't, but I don't think I would anyway. Uh, what we do is change the thresholds so we can inhibit or activate neurons. And the beauty of all this stuff now, and you'll see how technology has advanced so much, is we can see changes in the brain as patients are getting treatment. So the EEG scanners that we use, and this is a 19 channel cat, actually show us progress. And this is a hell of a lot better than self-report, which we all know how inaccurate that is. The biofeedback you just saw, which is heart variability, works by activating baroreceptors that send the message to the brain that is the opposite of an SOS. It's, uh, you know, when you get your heart rate swinging up and down as you inhale it climbs, exhale it drops, baroreceptors send the message that deactivates the amygdala. It's taken offline. You can't drive a car while you're doing it. You, it you, 
very sleepy. It's also a very good treatment for insomnia. Um, so, go on. Okay, so, um, as behavior therapists, the goal in exposure therapy is to get patients out into the situation. If you're afraid of bridges, well, let's go to the bridge. The problem is, it takes a lot of time, patients are terrified, and it's potentially dangerous. I've twice almost lost my life by patients having a panic attack where I miscalculated and the patient lost control of themselves. One became psychotic um, and actually turned the wheel of my car as we were approaching the Tribor Bridge. Uh, that's why now we give an MMPI to every patient before we start treating them to make sure uh, we're treating an anxiety disorder and not an underlying psychosis. The virtual reality serves as a bridge uh, and a wonderful one. This is how technology has changed so much. The stick thing on the top right there, that's what you saw Claudia with. And it's a monster. It was heavy, it gave people headaches. In 2012, Sony got into the act with the machine underneath it. At the bottom, right there, this is, usually I say it's the future, but this is the present because we've got something even better right now. With this, a company called Sios out of Barcelona figured out a way for cell phones to be used with Google Glasses and uh, you need a computer and the programs are all pre-recorded. It's one-tenth the price. In 1999, a system cost $15,000. This costs $100 a month. So Moore's Law effect squared. Patients can now simply, we put a cell phone in there, and there are six or seven different protocols. The most common one being fear of flying, public speaking phobia, fear of injections, uh, spiders. They found out using something like virtual reality, that people actually are affected psychologically. In our objective test, we found that people, if their avatar is taller, feel more powerful afterwards. If their avatar is more confident, it raises their confidence. Uh, and, and by the way, this is the cognitive behavioral approach. You know, CBT classically works in three areas, behavior, which is what you do, affect, which is how you feel, and cognition, which is what you think. That's the whole thing. They all affect each other in predictable ways, so you intervene on one and the other two change. And that's the basic model behind all this stuff, including virtual reality. So if you force someone to act differently, the message to the brain is, I'm actually this person right now. It, it sounds crazy. You know, it's like the old thing, if you're, if you're in the woods at night, let's say, and you hear a loud crack because the tree's falling down, you start running for your life. And then once you're out of danger, a friend grabs you and says, what's going on? What are you running away for? Well, I'm running because I heard this tree coming down. I thought I was going to get killed. You're only 50% correct in that analysis. Yeah, you were running because you're scared, but just as much, you're scared because you're running. The brain is constantly monitoring what we're doing at a muscle skeletal level. Not the viscera, not you know, those butterflies in the stomach, but muscle and bone. So if you act casual and relaxed, believe it or not, it helps. The worst thing you want to do is come like this 
And this to the brain is, if I'm behaving protectively, I'm asking for reassurance, this must be dangerous. That's why phobias always get worse all the time. There, there are three conditions we treat that consistently are progressive and get worse. OCD, phobias, and addictions, and all for the same reasons. The way you act determines the way that you feel, just as much as the reverse. <clears throat> First of all, any questions so far? I want to talk about, uh, well, let me talk about neurofeedback right now, because this is the real game changer. Uh, Ten years ago, a database was developed, and we now know what the human brain ought to look like at 88 Brodman areas. The brain is divided into 44 sections based on tissue, skin tissue. And we've taken measures of what healthy brains look like from age two to 82. So we start with a test called the quantitative electroencephalogram, or QEEG. For the first time now, this happened less than a year ago, we can actually do it without electroencephalogram. Dry caps have just come out, and uh, that makes an amazing difference because our female patients would not come in during the day and go back to work with their hair in this. Some of them kept shampoo and a hair dryer in the office, but uh, that wasn't too practical either. So we can now, with a dry cap, read human brain waves in the office. So we do a go into the database and we say, this is where you dysregulate. If you've got ADD, that's too much theta wave activity in the frontal area. So, kid sitting in class, staring out the window at the space because he can't follow what the teacher is saying, he's diagnosed with ADD. If the kid's brain is not mature enough to follow the teacher and he acts out to draw attention to himself, shooting spitballs, making nuisance out of himself, he's diagnosed with ADHD. Neurologically, they're identical. It's the coping response that's different. The underlying issue is the same. There's too much theta wave or drowsy activity and not enough beta waves. And this is simply another form of biofeedback. We show people exactly what's going on. They see all 19 channels right in front of them. And biofeedback is operant conditioning. They change it. Now, people say, well, how do you do it? Well, I'll tell you a story. In the late 70s, there was some research on a Montefiore. They took a cat and they starved it for three days. Now, in all felines, from the biggest lion to the smallest house cat, there's an unusual brain wave that occurs in nature anywhere between one month, once a month to once a week. EEG is put on the cat's occipital lobe back here. And the only way the animal could get food and water was to produce that wave. Now, there was no quick start guide or no manual, but within 24 hours, the animal was producing the wave nonstop and eating and drinking all at once. Now, that's a process that does, the, the description does not exist in the English language, although I'm sure it does in India somewhere, where altered states are much more part of the culture. But a process takes over that, I don't know if it's unconscious or automatic, but it's there. And I think this is the future of clinical psychology. I think it, uh, the human brain is capable of doing incredible things, and we are the pioneers right now. Um, neurofeedback, unfortunately, is expensive. A EEG scanner uh, starts at $20,000, and that's just the early software and hardware. The latest break, and I think what's really going to change things, a, is a device called the Muse, which is, you know, you can get it on Amazon for a couple of hundred bucks. Well, these geniuses, Tel Aviv, 
company called My Lift. To get out of the way, they reverse engineered and broke down the entire product and wrote what I think is a brilliant piece of software. Where it looks like. Right here? Pretty simple, right? This, this is five electrodes in the front, and you can put an auxiliary one any way you want. The, those are all dry electrodes. The auxiliary electrode is wet, so uh, that's up to the clinician. The whole thing is done through a cell phone at home. There are apps on the patient's phone. It's like a running, keep the kid running. I mean, you have all these choices. You know, be better when your brain waves hit what we set the protocol up for, you run faster. So, kids think they're just playing a game. And the stuff is automatically sent to the computer of the psychologist because they'll only sell these things to mental health professionals and physicians. And we see everything. We control the protocol, we see their brain waves, we see the raw signal, and we see the conversion. This, I believe, is life-changing because one of the problems with neurofeedback has been that people only come in once or twice a week. It's not enough. We have kids do this 10 minutes a night, and we're seeing the success rates of the treatment for ADHD because compliance improves so much double and triple, and we're just starting this right now. This is less than six months old. Um, if, you, if you're interested in this, you can just go to their website. Um, it's life-changing, I think. Um, it also can be used as an adjunct to cognitive behavior therapy for adults or children. That's all I gotta say. Um, any questions? I've been given the hook.